Thank you. So, uh, let's welcome our keynote speaker who came here from uh, Paris, Professor Albert Biffet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, also I'm very impressed with the work that uh, you are doing and the, the future work that uh, you are planning. So, yeah, I, I come from, from Paris, from Telecom Paris Tech. This is a, a grand école. This is a school of telecommunications engineering. Uh, and before, I've been uh, working at the uh, University of Waikato in New Zealand. Uh, I'm originally from Barcelona, so I, I did my PhD, my PhD studies in Barcelona. And then uh, I've also been at uh, Huawei in Hong Kong and Yahoo Labs in, in, in Barcelona. So I, I'm going also, during this talk, I'm going to try to motivate why uh, machine learning for data streams, I think it's important and why this is something that can be helpful uh, in the field of uh, data science and, and machine learning. So, so basically I'm going to, to, I'm going to start motivating it, so why this is important and then I'm going to, to try to explain a little bit uh, some of the challenges that uh, data science, artificial intelligence have and then how machine learning for data streams can be helpful for for this. And also at the same time I'm going to be explaining some of the open source projects that we have been working on and some of the research that we have been doing. Okay, so yeah, let me start with uh, some uh, motivation for data streams. So there are many applications, but maybe the most important one could be this Internet of Things. So this is, as you know, all of these devices that are connected and the, the predictions are that we are going to have more than 20, 30 billion devices in 2020 and all of these devices are, are going to be connected through the internet and are going to be producing a lot of data. Okay, so these is the devices are going to be producing a lot of data in real time and we should be able to analyze that in a very efficient and fast uh, way. So as, uh, as you may know, there are so many applications. So uh, for example, in energy management, so we have all of these uh, smart meters in France, uh, uh, EDF is, is going to have a smart meter in, in each one of the houses and they, they are going to send the information if they are connected in the internet uh, uh, every second. And the ones that are not connected every 10 seconds. So this is going to produce a lot of data and how to analyze this is, is going to be really, really challenging. Of course, we have a smart home, smart home, so you know now with all of these products of uh, Amazon, uh, Google, but yeah, also smart cities, all of these sensors that we have in the cities and how we can use them to, to produce uh, uh, better decisions to, to improve the, the quality of life. And of course, uh, industry. So I think industry also is very, very important for IoT. So just uh, to mention this idea of industry 4.0, so this is an idea of the German government. And the idea is that, um, yeah, we have, uh, we had four, for industrial revolution. The first one was the one based on steam, the second one was based in electricity, the third one was the one based on computation, and now we have this uh, fourth one that is based on, on interconnected uh, computation. So the idea for this industry 4.0 is to have a virtual copy of everything that is happening inside a factory. So, and why? Because we want to improve how we make decisions. So most of these decisions are going to be automated, but most of them are going to be made by humans, but uh, with uh, much more data, so the decisions are going to be uh, better. And just only to show that uh, Internet of Things is, is getting uh, uh, popular. So in Google Trends, if we look at the popularity of uh, Internet of Objects and uh, big data, we see that in five years ago, in, in 2012, uh, big data was really, really popular, but now we see that uh, Internet of Things is getting much more, more popular. Okay, so and just uh, only to, to mention uh, why uh, machine learning is really, really important and is, is, I think it's also the starting point of this new revolution. So this is something that Andrew Ngu said that uh, machine learning is like the new electricity and uh, we are really in, in the starting uh, phase of a new big, big uh, revolution. So I think basically because machine learning allows us to automate things in a much smarter way. So the idea of machine learning is that uh, yeah, we can uh, have uh, uh, computers that can uh, learn without being programmed. So it's, it's going to be change how we do computation. So before we need the experts that they need to decide how to do the programming, but now we can uh, have these machine learning uh, algorithms that they can teach uh, themselves how to make things. So uh, let me show you 
what's what this idea? So the idea is that in, in computer science we have really many, many applications where we are taking decisions, okay? And these decisions can be, I don't know, um, positive, negative, several labels, and then we need, uh, we have uh, input data, and then we build our programs that they need to make these decisions. Okay, so until uh, now, let's say that we were, were using this imperative programming and we were writing the programs, yeah, using these uh, whiles, these loops, and all of these uh, structures, but uh, we really need to, to have some experts that uh, should uh, understand uh, how to make the, these programs. Now, the nice thing of this uh, machine learning is that, as some people, they call it now software 2.0, is that we can replace how we do the programming by these machine learning algorithms. So the machine learning algorithms, given the data, they will be able to, how to make uh, smart decisions, how to make decisions without uh, needing someone to make the program so yeah, I think this is really important because that will allow us to automate many, many, many things. And yeah, and uh, you can see that uh, nowadays there are many people starting to talk about all of these uh, applications. So I think this is why machine learning is really, really important because this is the starting point of this new new revolution. And also, yeah, in, <clears throat> at least in in Europe, uh, we are talking a lot about uh, artificial intelligence. So instead of uh, uh, talking only on big data, data science now, the, 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 let's say the, the hot uh, topics are artificial intelligence. And basically artificial intelligence is really, really hot right now uh, due to machine learning. Basically because machine learning in the last uh, five years has made a big advancement for two things. One is uh, due to the quantity of data that we have. That's, that's really something that we didn't have before and also of the uh, computational power that we have. So this is something that we didn't have before. So having the large quantity of data and this uh, large computational power, now we can be able to do things that before were not possible. So I think this is uh, the main reason why now artificial intelligence and machine learning is really, really becoming a, a hot topic. Okay, so talking about this artificial intelligence, so we have also um, this idea of artificial intelligence systems that are more complex than the, the standard machine learning uh, methodologies. So, yeah, this is uh, like this, this uh, definition of Nicola Kasabov that says that these artificial intelligence systems should be systems with, uh, that can uh, uh, accommodate new problem solving rules incrementally, they should adapt online and in real time, they should be able to analyze themselves, they should learn with huge quantity of data, big data, and also they should uh, have this uh, short and long-term memory to forget things. So for this, for building these uh, systems, uh, data streams are really, really uh, uh, powerful and really suitable for this. Why? Because the idea of data streams is as this data that arrives continuously on, on real time, and then we want to analyze it. But then, as this data is so huge, we need to do that uh, very efficiently in terms of time and memory. Uh, and also, at the same time, we need to adapt. So the data may be changing over time, and then our models should be adaptive. They should uh, adapt to these uh, changes. So just to, to, to explain a little bit the difference with the traditional techniques. So in the traditional machine learning, what we have is that we have our data set that is stored in memory or in disk. And then what we do is that we build our model. Okay? So we suppose, basically, that our data set is static, okay? and that uh, we can do many, many iterations over the data. So this is the standard uh, approach. But what happens in data streams? In data streams, what happens is that first, data is not uh, there. Data is going to be arriving continuously. And data may be changing. Okay, so we cannot assume that the data is going to be static. Data may be changing over time. So how we process with uh, data streams? So what we do, basically, is that uh, instead of waiting to have all the data and then build the model, what we are going to do is that we are going to update our model continuously. So every time a new instance arrives, what we do is that we update our model. Okay, so instead of, of waiting to have all the instances and then build the model, what we do is that incrementally we update our model. So the advantage of this is that if the data is changing, then our model also can be changing. Okay, and then our model should be adaptive, and if it detects that there is change on the data stream, the model will be changed and will adapt to the changes on the, on the data streams. So just to, to mention, this example, so this is uh, an example of classification of uh, spam uh, in, uh, in comments of Yahoo News. So we have two models, the blue one and the red one. So the blue one is the one that we don't update. So what we see is that the performance over time 
uh, goes down. And the other one is the online, the ones that we are updating continuously. What we see is that uh, the performance still is good and is not going down. So it's, it has the capability of adapting to the changes and this is something that is really, really useful for this. Okay, so that was the motivation. So now I, I would like to, to talk about some of the challenges of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And for this, I'm going to use this uh, report of uh, Cédric Villani. This is a, a French uh, Fields Medal that uh, this year has presented this uh, report uh, that is called For a Meaningful Artificial Intelligence Towards a French and European Strategy. So the idea is, is was made by uh, top uh, researchers in France to propose what uh, Europe should be doing in, in artificial intelligence, in the sense that, uh, as you may know, uh, US, US, yeah, United States and China are really, really good at artificial intelligence, but because basically they have a lot of data, and this is uh, giving them a, a huge, a huge advantage. So yeah, they, they have this uh, report where they explain a little bit what are the challenges of artificial intelligence and what are the things that uh, Europe uh, should do for for this. So yeah, the first one was uh, open. Open data science, okay, open AI. So what's the idea? The idea is that uh, we should be able to, uh, everything that we do should be open in the sense of uh, uh, data. Data should be open so that uh, we can replicate experiments. We can, we should, uh, software should be open so that we can also replicate the, the experiments with this open source uh, software and then also publications and uh, access to all the research that uh, we have. So for this, yeah, I would like to, to start talking about MOA. So MOA is an open source software that uh, we developed at the University of Waikato. It's the same group of uh, Weka. And it's a, a software that is specific for data streams. So is, if Weka uh, keeps everything in, in memory and can do many iterations over the data, MOA is not storing the data. It's uh, looking at the data only one time, only doing one pass, and then it's updating the model. Okay? So it's really, really different. So yeah, let me show you uh, a quick example. Only. Yeah, so if uh, this is Weka, well, maybe it's a bit small. So the idea in Weka is that, yeah, we built, we open one data set. In this case, this is the uh, Iris data set. So the Iris data set is a, a data set that uh, we use to predict uh, which flower uh, we want to predict the iris setosa, iris versicolor, iris virginica. And then for doing this, we are going to use only the measures of the petals and the sepals, the length and the width. Okay, and then this is a, a very classical example. So the idea is that we take the, this data set and then we classify, we decide what is the classifier that we're going to use. For example, I'm going to use a, a decision tree. And then I start, I run the experiment, and then at the, at the, at the end, I have one result, OK? So it means that, uh, yeah, we, we classify it correctly 96% of the times. So this is the standard way of uh, doing this machine learning. Uh, MOA, the other way you see, it's going to be running this on, on, on online. So here we are going to specify that we're going to run this experiment. And then instead of getting uh, one number, what we get here is a, a time series, where it is saying us the performance, how it's evolving over time, okay? So, yeah, th this is the difference. In, in the static setting, we only get one measure of the performance, but here we are getting a, a time series that is giving us the performance of the model over time. So this is for classification, but for clustering. So, yeah, imagine in, in the standard clustering, uh, what we have is that we have the points, and then what we do is that we decide what are the, the clusters, okay? And then also we do many iterations over the data and this. But what happens in streaming? In streaming, what happens is that data is going to be uh, evolving over time. So it means that, yeah, all of these clusters are going to be moving, they're going to be merging, splitting, they're going to be appearing, disappearing, okay? And we need to do this on real time. So this is much more challenging because as you can see, data is evolving, cha changing, and then our method should be adaptive to all of these changes. Also, you see at the measures, also the measures are evolving over time. So let's say that uh, this is a, a more challenging setting for this, no? because data may be changing, and also because we need to do that in a very efficient way in terms of time and, and memory. Okay. 
Okay, so that, uh, this is um, Moa. This is a software that is in Java, and it's open source, and it's uh, available. And then they have many methods, classification, regression, clustering, frequent pattern mining, outlier detection. This is from the University of Waikato, New Zealand. So this is a, a software that was started at, uh, at the PhD thesis of Richard Kirby and was supervised by Jeff Holmes and Bernard Faringa. And I'm working on that uh, yeah, from 10 years ago with them. And they have been many, many contributors. I think uh, on data stream mining, this is the most popular software. Uh, right now, in terms of uh, downloads and citations. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Weka has been very, very popular all of these years uh, because they have this, this book that was uh, used in all, uh, in all data science courses, that, uh, this book on data mining, practical machine learning tools and, and techniques. Um, yeah, and uh, I don't know if you know New Zealand, but yeah, New Zealand is very famous for native birds, so birds that are only uh, from New Zealand, so the, the the New Zealand is an island, so these are birds that uh, they appear only there. And yeah, Weka is one bird, so this is the, the origin of the name. And uh, Moa was also a bird. The only thing is that uh, Moa is extinct uh, right now, so we cannot, uh, yeah, we cannot see them. But uh, yeah, and the main difference is that it was really, really big. So if we compare the size of a Moa with a Weka, we see that the Moa were really, really big uh, birds. So also with this idea of big data, no? Yeah, and this is comparing with the size of a human, or yeah, just comparing with me. Okay, so in, in terms of evaluation, when we have uh, this stream setting, we have uh, yeah we have the restriction of time and memory. So uh, we, and we are going to be processing all of this data in real time, and we should be able to make predictions on real time uh, continuously, and at the same time uh, update the, the models. So there are two types of evaluation. One is called uh, holdout and the other is frequential. So holdout is when uh, we really have data for testing and data for training. So this is the most simple case. This is similar to the bytes uh, setting. And frequential is when what we are doing is that every time a new instance arrives, first we use it to test and then to train. Okay? So if we do this, uh, we're not do doing anything wrong if we first use to test and then to train. The problem is, is we do the other way. If we first use to train and then to test, then uh, this is going to be problematic. But if we do like this, there's no problem, and this is the standard evaluation that we have on, on streaming. Okay, and then as I mentioned, yeah, we have uh, clustering, but we have also many other uh, algorithms. For example, when we, instead of predicting only one attribute, we want to predict many attributes, so we have multi-label, multi-target attributes, outlier detection, concept drift, uh, active learning, and also frequent items and mining and graph mining. We can use it uh, from the graphical interface, but also from the command line and also from the, the Java API. And also, something interesting, this year we have published this book uh, on MIT Press, uh, Machine Learning for Data Streams, with practical examples in MOA. And the nice thing is that it's open uh, available, so you can you don't need to buy it. You can go to the website and you can read, uh, and it's uh, online and it's uh, available. And not only this, you can also discuss and comment. So you can also, uh, if there's something that you think can be improved in the next edition or something, you can comment and you can uh, uh, put. But for me, the most important thing is that it's uh, open, available, and and uh, yeah, basically you don't need to buy it to to use it. There are other tools that you use more. So this is a. Adams, this is a, a workflow engine um, that allows to use Weka Moa to, to, instead of building programs in Java, to build uh, like uh, workflows that then you can replicate uh, much more easily. We have Meka, this is an extension of Weka, but for multi-label, so multi-output. So the idea is that instead of predicting one, one attribute, we can predict uh, many attributes at the, at the same time. And uh, yeah, also, we have this collaboration with OpenML. I don't know if you know it. This is a, like a social network of data scientists where the, the data scientists can put uh, data sets and, and uh, run the experiments uh, on the algorithms and then uh, get uh, the results. And then we can share all of these results. So for example, you can uh, run your experiment using uh, Rapid Miner, Weka, Scikit-Learn, and more. You run your experiment, you upload the results, and then everybody can benefit of this of these results. And also at the same time, you can see the results of other people with this data set with trying with many, many people. So it's, 
I think that's also a very, very nice idea of open data science on where data scientists can, can share their results and their discoveries. And finally, as you may know nowadays for data science, Python is really becoming very, very popular, and especially scikit-learn, that also is software that was started in Paris. Uh, so yeah, as uh, we know that uh, the usage of notebooks is becoming very, very popular. So this year also we started this project that is called Scikit Multiflow, that is something like uh, MOA, but in, in Python. So it's, it's like an extension of scikit-learn uh, to do a stream, a stream machine learning. Okay, and the idea is very simple. It's really similar to, to MOA, but uh, in Python. So we create a stream, then we decide what is the classifier that we're going to use, and then we run an evaluation. For example, in this case, we run evaluate frequential, and then we get the, the results. Okay, and then it's going to be like in MOA. We, we are going to have also the evolution on real time of the measures and how the performance is, uh, is going uh, on real time. So that's the same idea, but now it's in Python and it's in, in you can use uh, Jupyter and notebooks for, for this. So this is work with uh, Jesse Reed at the Polytechnique in France and uh, with Jacob Montiel, that is my PhD student, that uh, he has been working uh, on this project. Also, he, uh, Jacob has presented uh, last week the IEEE Big Data Conference. Uh, Last week, I uh, work on, uh, I think it's very interesting, is uh, learning uh, fast and, and slow, and, and how to do fast and slow machine learning at the same time. So this is based on this book of uh, Daniel Kahneman, it's Thinking Fast and Slow. And the idea maybe is to see if uh, basically as humans, you now we have these two systems, a system that is very, very fast, and a system that is, is slow, we can uh, apply this to, to machine learning. So as uh, you may know, we have these two systems. One is very, very fast, that it's very intuitive, so we don't, basically we don't think, we, we get the result. And the, the other one is the, the most uh, effortless, um, the one that requires more effort, that is the system two, that uh, requires to do slow thinking. So for example, if I ask you one plus two, you don't need to think, you, you know the result. But if I ask you 75 plus 26, then uh, you will need to, to think, and and uh, you will use this uh, system too. Okay, so the idea is that uh, there are uh, humans who use these two systems, not one that is really, really fast, efficient, and another one that is much more slow. So the idea maybe is that, yeah, basically in machine learning we can have the same. It's not that streaming is the, the only right solution or the batch is the only right solution. Maybe the best solution is the combination of both. No? Maybe we need something that can be fast that can be very, very efficient based on streaming, and maybe we can have something that is uh, slow that requires more time. So the, the, this is a typical example, for example, is deep learning. Now, in deep learning, basically, we cannot have uh, in streaming. We cannot uh, have a, a very fast uh, deep, uh, uh, deep learning techniques because uh, we need to do many, many iterations over the data, and this is going to consume uh, a lot of time and energy. So maybe um, yeah, a, a good way could be to, to have a combination of, of both. Okay, this fast system that is uh, really, really fast, really accurate in terms of memory and time, and this is a slow system that uh, takes much more time. So yeah, this is uh, what we did in this uh, work. What we have is that we have these two systems, uh, fast and uh, slow, and then yeah, we are going to use uh, which is the one that is performing the best to make the predictions of the new instances that uh, they, they arrive. Okay, so in terms of what is happening is that the fast is able to predict and is training uh, always. Uh, there's no difference. And the slow, of course, is going to take, it's going to collect instances and then train the model, and then after that is going to start to make uh, the predictions. So yeah, this is our, these two ways of working. And the interesting thing is that uh, combining both, then we can get the, the best of the both uh, uh, classifiers. So sometimes the fast classifier is going to be much efficient, especially at the beginning, no? So, but then sometimes the slow learner could be more accurate, and then in that case, uh, as we combine both, we can get the, the, the best of both worlds. So I think this is really interesting, and this is something that uh, I think it's very promising research uh, for the future. What is the best way to combine these fast and slow learners? Okay, another 
challenge that I think it's important is this green uh, uh, artificial intelligence, green uh, machine learning. So yeah, one of the things that the report uh, was saying is that yeah, uh, by 2040, the energy required for computation will equally have exceeded world energy production. So as you know, with the bitcoins now, the electricity that we are consuming uh, for bitcoins is the same that uh, all is consuming all a country like New Zealand. So it's really, really huge. But not only on the bitcoin, also in machine learning and artificial intelligence. So if we look at the at the yeah, the computation, the, the energy that we were consuming uh, in 2013 with the first uh, Alex uh, uh, net and we compare with the, right now with the uh, last uh, AlphaGo Zero, we see that they had uh, an increment of 300,000 uh, times. Okay, so it's really, really, we are consuming much more energy than we were consuming before. No? So this is really, really uh, huge and yeah, maybe we need uh, more uh, methods that uh, should be uh, greener, that should be really more efficient. And uh, I think the, the best uh, strategy is going to be using approximate methods, okay? That the idea is that we will be happy with having methods uh, with the small error epsilon with high probability one minus delta. So the idea is that if we, instead of running a method for one week, we can have a, an approximate solution that we can, re we can run in minutes, we will be happy to have the solution that uh, we had in, in minutes. Huh? So this is, this is the idea of uh, this way of doing uh, uh, computation. Uh, yeah, I like this example. So imagine that we have eight bits, okay? And then we want to, we have a stream and we want to count events, okay? And we only have eight bits. So how many events can we count um, using uh, this uh, eight bits counter? So of course, if we want the exact solution, this is going to be 256, okay? But that's a nice thing. Uh, and this is, uh, was the first uh, uh, streaming uh, research uh, paper that was called Counting Large Number of Events in Small Registers from Bob Morris in Bell Labs. He was able only using eight bits to store 130,000 events, okay? Only using eight bits, 130,000 events, okay? So this is, for me, it's a very nice example of, effici of efficiency, no? How we can, only using eight bits, as count 130,000 events. So how he was doing this? So basically, instead of storing the, the number, he was storing the logarithm of the number, okay? So that's the idea. The idea is that instead of storing the number, we should store the logarithmic of the number. And how he was doing it? So he was doing it very, very simple. So uh, so it's the standard way, every time we have a, an event, we add uh, one to uh, the counter. Uh, if we do that in a probabilistic way, what we are going to do is that we are going only to add one uh, with probability p, okay? And if this probability p is a power of two, the negative power of two, then what we are doing is that we are storing the logarithm of the number, okay? So that's a, that's a very clever trick, but uh, yeah, all of these combinations of these ideas could uh, make uh, the algorithms much more uh, faster, efficient. Uh, of course, are going to be approximate. We are not going to have the exact solutions, but uh, we may uh, reduce the, the energy that uh, we are consuming. And streaming uh, algorithms are based on these ideas. Okay, another important challenge uh, is explainable AI, especially uh, in Europe. So the idea is that, uh, yeah, we don't want to, to, to be governed by black box algorithms. So, yeah, there was this uh, tweet of Pedro Domingos. Pedro Domingos is, uh, is one of the, the most uh, uh, famous researchers in, uh, in machine learning. He has published a, a nice book, The Master Algorithm, and he has been working on the field for many, many years. So in the, he had this tweet in January saying that starting May 25, the European Union will require algorithms to explain their output, making deep learning illegal. Okay, so why he was saying that uh, deep, learning, deep learning was going to be illegal? Uh, basically because uh, we have this new law in Europe, this, this uh, general data protection regulation, okay, and in this uh, article, the 22, they say that uh, the data subject shall have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, okay, including profiling. So basically we need an explanation. And this is something that deep learning is not giving. No? So now the problem is, yeah, it's really 
deep learning going to be illegal? Yeah, of course not, because there is many solutions. One of the solutions is this LIME uh, methodology. Uh, this is of this paper, why should I trust you, explaining the predictions of any classifier. So the idea is very simple. If we want to, to make a, give an explanation, what we can do is that, imagine that in this case we have these two class problem, we have the, the borders for each one of the, the class. So if we want to give an explanation, what we do is that we build a local model, only on the points around the, the point that we want to give the explanation. Then we can build a, you know, a linear model or we can build a decision tree. And then, basically, we can explain uh, why our deep learning uh, network is giving this uh, explanation. Okay? So there are many ways, and I think also explainable AI is, is very, uh, it's a very interesting topic uh, right now. Yeah, and of course, one way to, to solve this uh, explainable AI is to use uh, explainable methods. No? And in this case, we have the decision trees. This is our very nice uh, algorithms because the, the, the model is really, really easy to interpret and to understand what's going on. And also, if we combine them uh, using uh, ensembles, we get really, really powerful methods. Uh, the thing is that a uh, decision tree is not really a streaming method uh, because for building a decision tree, we need to uh, when we need to do a split, we need to mm, compute the statistics and uh, we need to look at the data that uh, we have stored in memory, okay? So that's, that's the problem. We can, the decision tree is not incremental. So for building a decision tree, we need to, when we need to do, decide to split, we need to look at the, at the data in, in memory. So how we can have a decision tree uh, streaming, uh, that is streaming, that is incremental? Well, basically, instead of storing the, Instead of looking at the data in memory, when we need to decide if we split or not, what we are going to do is that we are going to wait to new instances to arrive. As uh, we are in this big data setting, we have new instances that arrive, so we'll wait to new instances that arrive, and then we'll use them to decide if we split or not. So how many instances do we need? So for doing this, uh, we use the housing bound to compute how many instances do we need to, to do this. So this is why this decision tree is called housing tree. It's called housing tree because we're going to use the housing bound to decide how many instances we are going to, to use to select uh, uh, if we do a split or not, okay? So this is this idea and then, yeah, basically we use the housing bound looking at the difference of the, in this case, information gain of the best two attributes. If this is higher than a certain threshold, then uh, we use it to, to yeah, to, to make the, the split. So this is a, a popular method now. So for example, in, uh, in, yeah, in TensorFlow, we have this TensorForest that uh, uses also this uh, housing tree to make it uh, more efficient. So now it, uh, it's also a, a good uh, method for not only doing uh, um, uh, streaming, but also to doing uh, uh, batch learning in, in an efficient way. Uh, another method that is uh, really explainable are uh, rules. So we have also these uh, uh, rules that are based on a set of rules. This is like the path of a decision tree, but the nice thing is that these rules can be overlapping, so we can be more flexible than uh, only using a decision tree. So we have these adaptive model rules. This is for work from a group of Java Gamma in Porto. The idea is that we have this set of rules, and uh, they are adaptive, so they can uh, adapt to the changes on the stream, and then we are going to take the, the average of this uh, prediction of these rules so that uh, we get uh, what is the final prediction. Uh, we have also presented last year this adaptive random forest. So the idea is to have, a, uh, as you may know, random forest is really a, a popular method in the sense that it is really, really uh, powerful. So yeah, there was no version on streaming, so we implemented this uh, random forest in streaming and that is adaptive. So the nice uh, thing of this adaptive random forest is that it's based on housing trees, on random housing trees. So as you may know, uh, random forest is based on bugging and, and, and using random trees. So in each one of the nodes, when we need to decide to split, instead of using all the attributes, we use only uh, use the root square of the number of attributes in a random way. So yeah, we, the Adaptive Random Forest is uh, combining online bugging, streaming bugging, with uh, these streaming uh, random decision trees. And uh, to, to see if uh, uh, 
if this tree should uh, adapt, uh, we use this uh, Adwin. This is a, an adaptive size lining window. That is a change detector that allow us to decide if we need to uh, restart a new model or not. Okay. So the idea is that we have this uh, Adwin this, uh, to each one of the decision trees. And when one of the decision trees accuracy goes down, then a new decision tree is created to replace it. Okay. And then Adwin is this. It's an adaptive size lining window that uh, if uh, there is no change, it's going to grow, 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 so it can make a better prediction. But if the size, if there is change, then it's going to reduce its size only to be consistent with the current distribution of the, of the data. And yeah, this is something that we have been applying for many years in many machine learning methods, as naive base, decision trees, uh, different buggings, uh, stackings, uh, nearest neighbors, random forest, and also in frequent closed tree mining and frequent graph mining. And uh, this year also, uh, they have uh, presented this parallel Adwin. So this is a paper for having an Adwin that is parallel and that can be really much more uh, efficient. That was a work from uh, the group of Bok uh, Markel in, in Berlin. That is the one that is implementing Flink. OK. And uh, yeah, another challenge is this um, about uh, ethical issues. So this is something that uh, this report of Villani was mentioning, no? because systems that incorporate AI technology are inviting our life. We legitimately expect them to act in accordance with our laws and social standards. And basically, the idea is this uh, right to be forgotten. Okay, so that's uh, this is something that also is in the general data protection regulation, and also they say that uh, yeah, the people should have the right to be forgotten, so the data should be removed. Okay, so in this sense, yeah, maybe uh, data stream mining could be helpful in the sense as you know, data streams is not storing data, so data stream can perform without storing data. So maybe there are some people that say that uh, maybe one solution is that data should have an expiration date. So yeah, the, uh, data stream mining, machine learning for data streams can be also helpful for, for this. OK, and now the last challenge is this uh, distributed uh, machine learning. So how we do this when uh, we really have big data, no? when we cannot uh, run this in, uh, using only one computer, we need to run this in a cluster. So how we combine streaming and this uh, distributed uh, computation. So yeah, for doing this, we at uh, Yahoo Labs in Barcelona, we created this project, uh, Apache Samoa. This is a project that is in the Apache incubator. And the idea is to have something like uh, Samoa, but uh, uh, that is uh, for big data, that is uh, distributed and can run in uh, these uh, stream, big data stream engines. In this case, uh, yeah, we can think of uh, Storm, basically, Flink, but also there is uh, SAMHSA, uh, GRPAMP, uh, Apex. So all of these are stream engines that uh, they are really, really, uh, they can process data uh, instance by one instance by one instance, and uh, in these uh, Hadoop uh, uh, clusters. So Samoa works that uh, we write our um, classifier, clustering methods, frequent pattern mining methods, uh, using the Samoa API. And then after that, we can decide where we deploy it. We can de decide that if we want to deploy it on Flink or on Storm. So yeah, in this, uh, uh, I think it's very flexible. And the idea is that uh, all of these, uh, Storm, Flink, uh, SAMHSA, they are very, very similar. So uh, it was possible to create a high level API so that we can uh, implement the methods uh, only once and then run in, in any of these uh, platforms. So only to show you an example, so this is the vertical housing tree. So imagine that we want to distribute this uh, streaming decision tree. So basically what we are going to do is that we're going to distribute it uh, vertically. So that means that uh, we're going to be distributing instead of instances that this is horizontally by attributes. And then we are going to have uh, our model and then we are going to distribute all the statistics of the of the nodes by attributes, OK? So let, let me show you an example. So imagine this is an instance that's arrived, that goes to the model, then goes to one of the leaves. And then, yeah, if we look at the second attribute, the, we see that this is going to go to this uh, node, OK? Another instance arrived, is going to go to another node, OK? And the information of the same attribute is always going to be in the same uh, node, okay? So this is how this uh, distribution is, is done. Yeah, this is why it's called a vertical housing tree. 
Yeah, and this is the people of, uh, that we created Apache Samoa, Yahoo Labs. And these are the supporting organizations that have been supporting, especially Yahoo Labs, Huawei, and Telefonica. And also, uh, yes, you may know also with big data, maybe Spark is the most uh, popular project right now. So we at Huawei in Noah's Ark Lab in Hong Kong, we decided to, to start a project that is called StreamDM. This is a project that is specific for Spark streaming, okay? This is made in Scala. All of these projects are open source, but this is made in, especially in Scala and especially for running uh, Spark streaming. The only difference is that the Spark streaming works on batches. So when you want to do a query or when you want to process, you need to process 1,000 instances or instances of one second. So you cannot have uh, latency in milliseconds. The, the other Samoa works on, with latency of milliseconds, and this is going to be working on latency of seconds. But as I said, uh, uh, Spark is really, really maybe the most popular big data tool uh, right now. Okay, so yeah, just uh, to conclude, yeah, I, I, in this talk I, I wanted uh, to motivate a little bit why machine learning for data streams could be useful, uh, why it could be important in, in the future, and I talk about these uh, challenges, these uh, open AI, green AI, explainable AI, these ethical issues, and this distributed uh, uh, data stream mining. Uh, if you are interested in the topic, yeah, the, uh, the, the book is uh, open available, so you can uh, read the book uh, online. And also, yeah, this year we started this uh, workshop on, uh, on efficient, uh, energy efficient data mining and knowledge discovery because we think also, yeah, this uh, how to do artificial intelligence data science in a green way is really, really an important topic and uh, it's going to be much more important in the, in the future. Okay, so thank you very much. Yeah, questions? Yes, please. So you described a few uh, adaptations to classic uh, machine learning uh, algorithms for the streaming setting. Uh, is there ongoing work, I guess there is, on, on uh, deep models for this setting? Uh, deep learning? Is yeah, deep learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the problem with deep learning is that uh, um, I, I, you, you have the data and then you do many iterations. No? And that's, that is the problem. That uh, In streaming we should do that only in, in, in one. So I think until now I haven't seen any, any work that uh, solves this because the day that we solve this, then uh, also we can reduce the time of building these uh, deep learning models. So I think this is really, really important. But still, I think uh, it's really, really challenging because you know, only doing one, one pass over the data, we really don't get uh, 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 the results that we get uh, with many, many iterations. So I think this is still open, uh, an open challenge and is still, still not solved. So I think that's... That could be a very interesting uh, research topic, but also very, very difficult. So, but uh, yeah, I think uh, it, it could be very nice to see advances in this, in this line uh, in the next year, yeah, because it could help also to make uh, deep learning uh, uh, much more efficient and much, much more, uh, yeah, it could uh, allow us to do deep learning using uh, less uh, resources, less energy. So I think it's a really, really important uh, research topic, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any other question or comment? I, I have a question. Uh, are there any open source uh, tools for mining uh, external sources of streaming data, you know, in, in real time? For mining external? External sources of uh, streaming data. Ah. That, you, that you come from the outside, not from your computer. Oh, okay. So you, you, you mean that, uh, yeah, getting data from, from, yeah, from sensors or from, from this and then to, to use it? Uh, like real-time traffic data or maybe real-time weather data, whatever. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah, there are two things. One is that uh, there are the software that is specific for, for capturing data on the Internet of Things, for example, and then uh, this is something that could be make, uh, put together with uh, these uh, machine learning algorithms, and then this should be something, I think, easy to do. 
The, the other important thing that you mentioned is that maybe we have several sources of data. And then, yeah, this is something that uh, still we are working only, supposing that we have only one source of data. And then this is really, uh, I think also this is a very interesting uh, topic of research, no? Uh, how we deal when we have, instead of only one stream, we have several streams of data, and then we want to, to yeah, to, to do some uh, uh, knowledge extraction. We want to, to make some classification combining all of these sources of information. Yeah, I think... Uh, I haven't seen too much research on, on this topic, but yeah, I think it's really, really important. And also, it could be very nice to extend extend this uh, software to allow to work with uh, several sources at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yes. So, uh, further to this question. Um, so, first, thanks for an excellent talk. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I think when you were speaking about uh, uh, analyzing data streams, it seemed that you were referring to when we have uh, several channels of data a long time and they all have measurements uh, like every second or whatever. Yeah. But I think when we look into Internet of Things, and for example, if we want to analyze a smart auditorium or a smart room or whatever, we would uh, take uh, data from different uh, types of systems. Maybe the, I don't know, some sensors here or the computer yeah. or the screen. And they all create different events. It's, and they are separate systems. They have uh, different types of events. So some of them, if there are sensors, they will... Uh, generate measurements in some fixed frequency every second. And maybe another sensor was programmed to uh, output a measurement every minute. And other, uh, <clears throat> other, if, um, uh, other types of uh, sources of information will create events that they don't have duration or their duration is like one minute or one time point. Uh, and other uh, events may have duration. So uh, if it's a traffic light, a period of time that it's green, something like this. So typically if we take all these types of uh, data sources, we get now uh, multi-channel data that has different forms. So if we had before in this uh, like a static decision tree, we had continuous variables and categorical variables. Now we have them also uh, in a more heterogeneous representation a long time. So yeah, so I just wonder what's your thought about this? Because you know, many methods can, do, can analyze only one type of data. Uh, so we have, uh, like you mentioned, frequent uh, sequential mining yeah. for events or time interval mining, but <clears throat> they cannot incorporate all these types of data. So. Yeah, yeah thank you. No, it's re really a short question. Uh, yeah, very <laughs> interesting question, and uh, I think it's very, very important what you are saying. No? Because uh, at least uh, in, in my feeling is that when uh, we are dealing with uh, data science, it's not only the machine learning uh, aspect. Uh, we have um, a very important part that is data engineering. Okay, that is how you get all of this data and you prepare the data so then after that we can apply the machine learning model. No? And in this case, yeah, in the real IoT scenarios, what we have is that we have a lot of data from many sources, and then we need to prepare this data, so then we can uh, run the, 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 the machine learning uh, uh, models. No? And uh, I think that, uh, yeah, this is really something that, uh, uh, at least, for example, in, in Paris now, we, we are starting to, to realize that we, we have a lot of focus on data science, but many enterprises, uh, many companies, they are needing a data engineer. So how to prepare all of this data so then after that we can really uh, run the, the machine learning methods in, in an efficient way, no? if not. And then, especially in real life, what we have is that we have different sources. This data is, as you said, is of very, very different types. And then uh, how we uh, combine, how we merge, uh, especially you, you were mentioning events. No? There are all these uh, complex event processing systems. So to do this, yeah, we need to, to do a lot of data engineering to decide uh, how we structure these events and, and then how we, we, we use this. No? So yeah, we have these uh, frequent pattern uh, mining methods that they, um, yeah, we have for graphs and for trees. 
But the idea then, yeah, that should be also be using sequences. So the idea then is that we try to put uh, our data in like a sequence of events, and then we try to, to get, uh, yeah, to extract some knowledge uh, from this. No? But as, as you said, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's clear that uh, these projects, I think also we are in the starting phase, so still it's simple, as uh, we were saying with Mark, this, this is only we supposing one stream, but in, in, in real life, yeah, we have several sources of many, many streams, and then we need to, to combine them. So, yeah, I, I completely agree that uh, this is something that, uh, yeah, as researchers, we should uh, yeah, uh, work on this because it's, it's, it's more a realistic setting, and, and this is uh, the, the main uh, application challenges that uh, we may have. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, any other question? Yes. About uh, explainable AI, uh, but from the legislation point of view, when the legislator asks AI to be explainable, it needs to be understood by whom? Because explanation can be at different levels. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's complicated, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not uh, easy. So I think what the, the, the the law says is that, uh, okay, if you make one, one decision based on, a, on, a, on a, an automated system, you need also to give an, uh, the reason why. So you need to, to give an explanation. So in that case, I, I suppose that especially in health, this is something that uh, if exactly. the system uh, is predicting uh, one illness, so you should say why it's predicting this illness. And I don't know, in the financial, you want to, to get a loan, and then they should also uh, give you the explanation of why they, they, they are not giving uh, uh, a loan or not, and yeah. So, so a professional that needs to use that decision needs to understand why they, it was no, made. They say that they, this, they, sh they should give a decision. So they not, they, yeah, so yeah, that, that's the tricky question. So the tricky question is that, okay, we, we don't need only to give a prediction, we need to give a prediction and an explanation. And then uh, everything is going to be fine. But the, the thing is that uh, we need to give this, this explanation. So for example, if we use a linear model, it's very simple because we, we can only use the, we can use the weights and give the weights for each one of the, the features and say, okay, so yeah, the, the decision is this because these attributes have a higher weight than, than the others. No? So this is very, very simple. Then in deep learning, yeah, this is not simple. It's not easy to, to do this, so then, I think this is why now this is a hot topic and there are many people that are trying to, to see how we can uh, uh, find ways to, to, to make these predictions of uh, neural networks. No? Because, uh, of course, the strategy, one strategy could be to use a simple model as a decision tree and then yeah, everything is easy to explain, but the methods are not so powerful as uh, using a neural network. So then, uh, yeah, I think this is very exciting right now because it's, uh, many people working on this, and, and, I, and I can imagine that as this is something important in the next two years, we'll see many, many advances on this, and many, many proposals of how we can address this, because it's not, mm. uh, it's not uh, <laughs> straightforward. No? We need to, to use some tricks to, to see how we can, uh, we can do this. No? Sure. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.